So I'm really happy to be here. It's the first time that I publicly present this project because we just launched it today. This is the first graphical user interface that was uh, ever introduced publicly. It was 1963, it was called uh, Sketchpad, I think. But I'm showing this now here because even though our online ecosystem is expansive, we just communicate through interfaces and we have no clue what's beyond the interface. It's really hard because it's a heavily obfuscated system that we don't have access. And more importantly, we cannot negotiate with, even though we think that we know what the internet is and how it looks like, but in fact, we just you know, are interacting through interfaces. That's it. I also like to start, generally I use this sentence for my workshops, but I think this is also an important thing to remember here because it explains a lot why the ad tech ecosystem grew so much and it's so pervasive and it's increasingly pervasive. Yeah, so powering the digital age is about making things easy. I thought um, Franco Berardi quoted this because I took it from a book of his, uh, but then, well, Bill Gates said this, it's a little bit less romantic, but still, I mean, Bill Gates knows exactly what he's talking about, right? And, and this sentence, it's absolutely true. Yeah. Power, uh, when it comes to extract data, and basically exploit users when you make uh, things or the, the devices we interact, the programs we interact, easy to use, you're just extracting more. And I think this has a lot of relations also with uh, Euler and new extractivism, yeah? Every time our interactions uh, with machines, with devices, which ultimately are the ones that can quantify and commodify everything that we do as mother, we just give up more data. We just give up more of our interactions. We just give out everything. Yeah? And that means that the symmetries of power between the ones who run the infrastructures and the ones who use them just increases dramatically. Yeah? And ad tech, I mean, is, is a perfect example of that. Yeah? So I'm really, I'm very sort of obsessed on uh, really revealing all these very hidden processes that are ultimately they are very uh, mundane because we use them every day. It's not some big ideas, no, it's things that happen and they're happening now as I'm connected to the internet and some of you are browsing. Yeah. So that's why it's very, very important to disclose these processes. So again, I think it's very important to situate like our context, like uh, financial context or, or capitalist system, I don't know, name it, whatever you want it, right? I, I really like uh, cognitive capitalism. I mean, it's been called a surveillance capitalism by Shoshana Zubov, it's been called necrocapitalism by Franco Berardi, it's been called uh, all sort of different names. I really like this because I think it explains very, very well. So, uh, in our current context, cognitive capitalism, wealth is no longer produced exclusively by material goods, yeah, by through intangible action shows, uh human communication, experience, intelligence, and anything we can do, right? Um, and that's how our life transactions are just being quantified and commodified, as explained before. And this is mostly possible because most of our life transactions are being mediated through a connected device, yeah? Which is what ultimately facilitates um, this commodification, yeah? Quantification and commodification of things that before weren't uh, possible to commodify. How could you commodify cognition? Or how would you commodify just the simple fact that I'm sitting in front of a computer watching Netflix, right? And Netflix is just sucking data of all my interactions, how I react to things. And that these reactions that I have are just generating revenues for a third party company, right? So this is possible through devices. And this is happening, by the way. Yeah, there is a lot of very dystopic uh, cookies that, um, and other tracking uh, technologies that are able to do that. So, ad tech. Ad tech is something that is mostly unknown for the average user or most of the users. I mean, even if, if it's a term that actually I learned before pandemic just, I think it was like really January 2020 or maybe a little bit before in 2019, um, because I called it just any other name, right? But the term is ad tech which is a short name for advertising technology and represents it's the biggest, uh, basically it's a business model that runs the internet or fuels the internet or the money machine that fuels the internet, um, right? And it just like, um, it probably refers to different types of analytics, digital tools uh, that includes many different processes 
that uh, even I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and these processes that are constantly changing, like real-time bidding, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to explain you a little bit about this. At tech, um, it's not by chance that it chose, or naturally, you know, uh, as, as we think, that it was adopted as the primary business model of the internet. This is something that came, you know, by a set of very precise choices. So Silicon Valley, that it's a cradle of, of ad tech, it was essentially a very nerdy culture run by engineers. Yeah? Um, and even Google didn't have, like uh, the end of 2000, end of 90s, uh, 2000, they didn't have a clear business model of how they would uh, make money out of their products. Their idea, for example, one of the ideas they had is that they would just uh, charge for licensing their search engine. So you would have a website and you would like to include one search engine in your website and then you would pay a license to Google. Um, and then the guys from Wall Street came in, <laughs> came to Silicon Valley and they basically idealized or um, conceptualized like the business model which is now called ad tech. Yeah? So essentially these guys came from Wall Street uh, with Wall Street ideas. Uh, so basically, the ad tech industry is a stock market of attention. Yeah, this is what it is. So the ideology that uh, imperated in Silicon Valley in uh, Wall Street was brought to uh, Silicon Valley, and that's how we have like a huge stock market of attention. Now, this could have gone any other way. Yeah? It just went this way. I think it's very important to remember this was a set of choices, and that's the internet we have is this one, because of Wall Street people coming to Silicon Valley. It could have just happened any other way, right? I mean, maybe we just bring, I don't know, like a bunch of, I don't know, whatever, you know? <laughs> I can't think of anything now. But I think it's something worth thinking a bit about it. And, and also it's very important to understand that all our interactions, all the way all these interfaces are being designed, it's just to fulfill this business model, yeah? At the, and to continue to fill in, um, data for this business model, yeah? And that's super important to understand. Yeah, like all, and I think Ben Grosser, this, I mean, Ben is, is gonna be great. I mean, he's really, he's really studied this and analyzed all these patterns of behavior and how like the simple, tiny, like uh, radio buttons or, uh, you know, text areas and the way uh, Facebook and uh, is being um, designed is exactly to, uh, to uh, keep on feeding this ecosystem, this business model, yeah? As a, an example of this, like Alphabet and Facebook, yeah, most of their revenues, like a big share of their revenues, uh, this is data from 2016, but still this just increased and increased, and especially after the pandemic, even increased even more, yeah, obviously because we're all much more hooked up to the internet, more than we were before, if that was ever possible. So the market cap for um, Alphabet and Facebook, it's basically, Advertising, yeah? I mean, that's how they are living out of. Hmm? Um, I read a very interesting book which said, compared the ad tech ecosystem with the subprime attention crisis, yeah? In the sense that it's such a bluff, it's such a bubble, and it is a bubble, all this ecosystem, and if it fails, the problem, it says, like, if this bubble fails, um, I mean, Google and Facebook, they're also, um, and all the other companies, I mean, it's not just them, it's many other companies, that they use monies from ad revenues to, um, to finance other, uh, other different enterprises, yeah? Just like uh, research and artificial intelligence and many, many other things. So if this market fails, there is a lot of things that are gonna go with it. I'm not saying that, you know, killing artificial intelligence is a bad thing uh, or a good thing. <laughs> but uh, I mean that there is a lot of work that is gonna, you know, like it's not gonna be a small crisis. It's gonna be like a domino effect. Yeah, so this is not nothing. That's why it's so important to uh, target advertising ad tech. It's essentially, again, like a business model rates and trading user attention, the same way stocks get exchanged in the financial market. Yeah, so the sense that I'm going to explain this with real-time bidding, um, but it's really important to understand that user data is the primary source of the ad tech ecosystem. Without user data, there is no ad ecosystem. That's why all these companies are so focused on absorbing any type of user data. Anything that can be collected, it's finally collected. Even if your eye is blinking, even if your finger is moving one micro millimeter, all those things are being recorded 
yeah, and quantified, commodified, right? This is a great research that was done in 2017 by uh, Crack Labs, uh, Wolf, uh, Wolfie Crystal and Sarah Speakerman, Sarah, yeah, I think that's the name, and which they think it was the first time that they, they didn't call it ad tech by then, um, but they sort of map all the complexities of this ecosystem. But this, I mean, it can give you a hint of how complex uh, this ecosystem is. But yeah, they have like a PDF online, you can also have print on demand. The study, uh, the report, it's called Networks of Control. It's, for me, it's like being like, a, it's a masterpiece. Uh, for me, it helped me to develop a lot of research um, in regards of surveillance, especially corporate surveillance. Okay, and then this guy comes. So, this guy is called Louis Montier. I can't pronounce it, it's French, but he's sort of American, I think, or half-half. Or maybe he just went to Silicon Valley at some point and he's French, I don't know. Uh, but this guy is the guy that invented the cookies. Yeah. Uh, in 1994. So 1994 marked a decisive moment in the story of the internet in the sense that before that, before the cookies existed, uh, surfing the web was a relatively easy and anonymous thing to do. Yeah? And when the cookies appeared, there was this potential. doesn't mean that cookies appeared to surveil people, but there was the potentiality that cookies, that the internet could turn into a place where every activity, everything that we would do would be recorded and stored. Yeah, it's like this easiest metaphor is like walking in the streets where there was no video cameras and walking in the streets where there is video cameras, right? So that's the thing. Um, Matthew Fuller wrote a beautiful text um, for this project, as already Yanis explained, and, and there is a quote there that he says that uh, these guys didn't really they alerted of this possibility of massive tracking through this new technology that was cookie. Yeah? When they designed this in the report or paper that they wrote uh, before we all, I mean, while releasing the cookies technology and explaining exactly how it worked, they also alerted that this could be the potential danger of massive surveillance. And voila, we have it, <laughs> right? It's here. In a nutshell, and this is a very easy and sketchy uh, draft of how data is being organized or collected. Like, so we generate data through phones, browsers, wearables, anything that is connected to the internet, right? Now with my computers connected to the internet, all the smartphones that uh, are here connected and probably projector, I don't know. Then this data is being collected by a process called, in terms of ad tech, it's online tracking. Yeah, so online tracking is done, well, I'm going to explain it after, but with cookies, all sort of different technologies. Uh, then this data is being sorted uh, through a process, it's called data mining. Data mining means this process of making sense of data, because um, there is a lot of data that's being collected, but not all the data is interesting or useful for now. Um, so data mining makes just, you know, like sense of the data that you want to collect, you want to extract. Then this um, data, when it's clean, it's uh, sort of used, uh, you do social sorting, so we rate and categorize the data. This is used on generally through a process of, uh, uh, of putting sort of behavioral patterns to so sort of data. Meaning that if you visit, I don't know, an Instagram that is for art, maybe you're a little bit neurotic. And if you visit book regularly, maybe you are um, a very conscious person, right? There is, um, this sort of analysis or sorting, uh, social sorting is done mainly through a model that was developed in the 70s, psychological model, it's called the Big Five. Probably you heard it with the Cambridge Analytica issue, it was called Ocean. Yeah, Ocean is just like the first letter of this five dimension of personalities, which is openness, agreeableness, neuroticism, and, and I can't remember the next, yeah? But basically it says that every human on Earth is a combination of uh, this five dimension of personality, yeah? And some of them prevail more than the other. Uh, and then all this, it's very easy, it's to predict future behavior, you know? Like you open the door to predict future behavior, it's called predictive analytics. Um, so when you understand or you have data on a person or community or group of people, for years, for years, or for months even. Like all these companies, they have much more information about our patterns that we will ever have because we don't record and store this and analyze it, right? So when you know exactly how somebody, uh, what triggers somebody, it's very easy to uh, make them change behaviors because you understand the triggers through the patterns. 
Yeah? And, well, next step, social engineering. This is not something new. I mean, uh, um, Edward Bernet, which is the, for the ones that don't know it, he was like a master in the shadows in the early 20s. Yeah, he is the father of PR um, and modern marketing. And he said that basically if you can control the mind of the masses, uh, you can control absolutely everything, right? Um, and he, I mean, funnily, he was the nephew of uh, Sigmund Freud, also on top of that. And again, I mean, that's the thing that also relates to uh, Yoller, you know, like there is all this group of data, all this data that is being collected all the time through cookies, through uh, fingerprinting, through anything, and all this data is being just fitted to train um, AI, yeah? So online tracking. It's this process of collecting data anonymously of the identity preferences, interests, and scenario for user. Basically, online tracking happens every time you open a browser and you navigate, you use an app, or you uh, just browse any website. Yeah, there is like all these cookies and all these other technologies that just suck data on everything that you do. Yeah, if you move the finger, if you blink one eye, uh, what did you click on, what you didn't click on, which website are you coming from, which website are you going to go, how many things did you buy, how many things you did not buy, how much money did you spend, etc., etc. everything that you can think of. All this data that is being collected, <laughs> it's then going to this big machine. Well, so we do likes, we click, we swipe, we review videos, we purchase, we do everything. So all this is going to like a big engine, which is called ad tech, that we have no clue what's happening there. And in question of milliseconds, you know, uh, we know which content is shown to us, which uh, particular advertising it's being shown to us how someone is being treated as customer, how a company tries to shape someone's behavior, how much you're gonna pay for a certain item, which uh, recommendations you're gonna see. Yeah, this is done exactly just analyzing all these profiles that have been created about a certain user. It's just like super analyzed, like okay, this person is now watching, uh, looking at book, um, and uh, well, we have something that we think it might interest him or her, and we're just serving this ad, all these preferences. Yeah? Same thing works for Amazon. So this is a uh, processes that involve crazy amount of algorithmic process, and it's been doing, it's done in milliseconds. Yeah, and I think you might understand it better when I talk about real-time bidding. Real-time bidding, it's also a process within ad tech, um, which is basically how advertising is being bought and sold. Yeah? by advertisers and by publishers. Yeah, so I have a flower shop. I always put the same example, but it works. Yeah, um, and it's, uh, I don't know, some Valentine's Day and I want just to, you know, sell more flowers. <laughs> and then there is like the New York Times. So the New York Times, they have a lot of inventory. So they have space that I could, I can go and put my flower advertising, yeah? So you can see it in the first page of the New York Times. But it's not that I call the New York Times, say, hey, yo, now in this second, for user, users that potentially uh, are interested in flowers, I want them to convince to get flowers, show this advertising. This is done through real-time bidding. So there is this bid that's opening, that's why it, it really works like stock market. So um, there is, okay, in New York Times, we have like 10 spots for this particular user that is looking at the website now, or ask a request for our website. And then it's like, okay, so flower shops, so then there is like 300 different companies that sell flowers that are very interested in getting that spot, yeah? So whoever pays the most is getting that spot. It's not that you can buy it directly from the New York Times. It just, you know, you're coming, you're bidding, and be the best bidder gets the spot, and that's it. But this happens every time. Every single user on this planet goes and sees a website. Yeah, and all this crazy, very obfuscated <laughs> process happen in a matter of milliseconds. Yeah, and all the energy consumption of this is absolutely obfuscated. Actually, like companies are not even obliged to disclose this, which I think that's a huge crime. For example, this is like different companies. These companies are called data brokers. It's companies that uh, basically trade in with data and they do all this sort of analysis and profiling and so on. And then, you know, like uh, give all the data to uh, advertisers so they can tackle, you know, like several users with several necessities and so on. Um, so just to make an idea, this is Axiom. This is the biggest data broker in the world. 
And Oracle is also very, very big. Oracle focuses very much in credit scoring. Um, so just to make an idea of all the points of information that might have in a single user, and this is just like an example. Uh, Axiom provides up to th more than 3,000 attributes for a person, whereas Oracle, I think it's more than 30,000 attributes. Yeah, so this is all the data that fits in all these algorithms that ultimately will decide which advertising you will get. And when it comes to advertising, it's relatively harmless. But uh, when it comes to which insurance you're going to get, whether you're going to have access to credit, and many other dystopic things that you know, I can think of in a future where the energy is going to be scarce and food is going to be scarce, right? And just like an idea of yeah, how much? And this data from 2019, I mean, this is, uh, is much larger now, even. Yeah, but how much uh, profiles Facebook user has? 1.9 billion. Um, also, Google has profiled 2 billion people. Axiom has that on 700 million people. 1 billion cookies. And you can see that most of, our, most of these companies are American. And the numbers of users they have information on, I mean, exceeds far the <laughs> US population, right? I mean, it's global. We are, what, 7 billion people? And uh, Google already claims to have 2 billion. That's a massive portion of user data globally. And this might be much bigger, actually. So these are the top 50 websites. And we see like how many million visits, billions of visits they have. Google 92.5, uh, Facebook 25.5 million, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, we do visit these websites a lot. <laughs> yeah, so imagine how much data they can collect. How many times did you visit Google today? I don't know. I can count it, really. I mean, I have no idea if it's 25 or if it's 200. I have no idea. And this is just today, right? Facebook, I quit Facebook long ago. The thing is, I cannot cancel my account because I forgot my password, and my password is attached to an email address that I don't have access to anymore. So it's a bit uh, weird. So my Facebook profile is going to be a ghost in Facebook, probably, but it's not <laughs> active. Um, in case somebody contacts me on Facebook and I never answer it, it's because I, I don't have access at all. So I've been researching the materiality of data for many, many, many years. The first project I released was in 2014. Um, and I think that's very important because even back then, I mean, I think that this equation of the internet equals uh, to a large energy expenditure, it's a little bit more embedded in our brain, but not really and not enough. And when it comes to analyze uh, processes, like smaller processes like cookies or any other thing, it's, it's even more weird. It's like, okay, well, cookie, a cookie has a, is polluting, like a tech, what is a tech? A tech is polluting, well, yeah, a tech is the primary business model of the internet, right? And nobody even knows, which is ridiculous. And I think it's dangerous because then if we don't understand how the system works, we cannot regulate them. If we cannot regulate them and control, the system can potentially fail. And the failing of the systems, they go far beyond harming Google or Facebook. Yeah, they're harming whole society. Yeah, and that's why it's so important to understand these processes. So that's like two weeks ago draft of Carbolytics. So what we did with, um, with Carbolytics, we analyzed all the cookies, uh, all the carbon costs of the cookies present in the top 1 million websites. The top 1 million websites is the most, the million most visited websites on the internet. And we came with these results. We could find for a single visit more than 21 million cookies. And we just analyzed visits to the first pages of all these websites. So this can actually be three times more. We've been very conservative with this. Um, we calculated that uh, almost 200 trillion cookies are created a month. Hmm? It's a lot. <laughs> it's imagine. It's really big. Yeah. Uh, and we got grades about 11,000 monthly metric tons of CO2 emission, which this, I mean, we're talking about cookies. That's a lot of CO2. Yeah. This equals to 25,000 households uh, for a year. I say, OK, yeah, compared to blockchain, compared to the aviation industry, it's not so much. Yeah, but we're just talking about the micro tip of the iceberg. It's the cookies that collect data. We have no clue what's happening beyond that, mm. which I have no idea. I cannot tell you if it's going to be 100 times more or 100,000 times more. Who knows? And we should know. <laughs> yeah. Well, these are not all the cookies. These are like 100, uh, first 100,000 cookies we've analyzed. And here you have like 
You have all this uh, data available in the project. We wrote a white paper where you have all this and you can just revisit all the results, how we did it, methodology and so on. Um, so this accounts for advertising, fingerprinting, so different categories. But we always find that advertising cookies are the ones that always waste uh, more energy and they emit more CO2 more than anything else. Yeah, cookies. Google Analytics is not surprising. Google Analytics, we found it in more than half a million websites. Yeah, TDCPM is a track desk. This is also a more unknown company, but it's like massive in terms of ad tech. Ad tech, programmatic advertising, it's sort of the same. Yeah, Google GID, it's also a Google cookie. AWS Help, as uh, Amazon Web Service cookies. Yeah, so you can see like the numbers are quite striking. Mm. In terms of CO2, it's not the same. Like <laughs> Google Analytics is quite, you know, low carb, <laughs> even though it's very pervasive, thank God, because otherwise. So we found something very re weird, like this cookie, it's uh, from Casale Media. It's a um, Toronto-based advertising company, but they are very little, they're unknown. It's not a big company, so we, <laughs> we guess that um, that's a glitch. There's a glitch in their system, we don't know. Yeah, their cookies are very long and they get created many, many times. Yeah, I don't know if it was with you, Yanis, but we discussed, I know with Matthew, <laughs> said like a glitch is gonna kill the world at the end, right? <laughs> so I think that's also a good example from it. Uh, so the second, this it's sort of according to the first results, the trade desk cookies, opt-in and consent. You know what is opt-in and consent, right? This is the cookie that allows you to withdraw from a pervasive tracking but it's a third most polluting cookie, yeah? Which I think is insane. In terms of organization, we also have the number of organization. We had a striking unknown. It's very hard to attribute cookies to organizations. It's just super hard because the ecosystem is so obfuscated that it's, we guess, I mean, we guess that half of these four million, we more or less knew that they belonged to a company, but we couldn't prove it. Yeah, therefore, we decide to be conservative and put it in the unknown. But it's crazy how much there is. I mean, there is a lot of initiatives that try to link organization to cookies, but it's very, very hard. Yeah. Um, Google, more than 2 million cookies. Popmatic, again, a giant of uh, ad tech. Uh, half a million. Verizon Media, which owns two Yahoo, 282,000. Yeah, but Google by far. <laughs> And I mean, this is, is not news. I mean, you know, like the biggest share of advertising belongs to Google more than Facebook, right? So in terms of CO2, of course, the unknown, but the trade desk is much more putting the Google, for example, because Ali Media again, because they have like these massive cookies, nobody knows where they are coming from. Uh, Adobe, Rubicon Project and Google. Yeah, but you see like the difference. In the future, we want to but for this, we need more resources and, and more funds to analyze and to try to link these four million cookies that we have left without, um, without an owner, because I think it would be very important to do this. In terms of websites, I love this. So the website with most cookies, it's a website, American website, with conservativenewsdaily.net. So it's quite poetic, right? Then there's this call, uh, PL, I think PL, it's Poland, maybe Poland, distanza.com. USA Procycling Challenge.com. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about 852 cookies. I mean, go inside now if you want to, you know, like get tracked like, uh, like crazy. Um, all free casserole receipts, 432. It's, it's <laughs> you know, come on. And this is just the first page. Uh, and then in terms of CO2, Netflix, just like the winner. Yeah, which uh, I was surprised. But yeah, Netflix, it just has the most, it doesn't have, it doesn't have a lot of cookies, but the cookies they have, they are very polluting, but they are very long. We calculated, we equaled uh, bytes, kilobytes transferred uh, in order to translate to the CO2. So Netflix cookies are very, very long. They transfer a lot, like the, the information they transfer, it's quite high. Yeah, then Temal.com is a Russian uh, mail system, Microsoft, Adobe, WebMD, Cloudflare, Google, New York Post, <laughs> maybe that's why New York, you know, they were a bit pissed. Anyway, uh, here it is. In terms of category, again, we couldn't attribute a lot of, uh, if we don't know where the cookie belongs to, it's very hard to attribute it to a category. Yeah, so advertising, as I said, it's the one that has most cookies, analytics, marketing, functional, fingerprinting, general, content, social analytics, disconnect, 
fingerprinting invasive and just 32 crypto, crypto mining cookies. And in terms of CO2 advertising, yeah, it is divided by marketing, analytics, content and functional unknown fingerprinting, but you see it, right? Like uh, that's a relation of CO2 emissions. Uh, in terms of host, so the thing is like a cookie is not always served directly from the owner. Yeah, a lot of times there is like a man in the middle, a woman in the middle. I prefer there is a man this time because it's fat. <laughs> Um, so there is like all these third party hosts that also have access to cookies and they serve cookies. So the biggest one was Pugmatic, the second one Casale Media, but this is really a glitch, we don't understand what happened there. Uh, Ad server, which is from the trade desk, Yahoo, Sync Apart, Recon Project, etc, etc. Yeah, like third parties that they also have uh, big players in the ad tech ecosystem. But a lot of times they're very obfuscated, yeah, because they're exactly in the middle. In terms of uh, host and um, CO2, again, Gazale Media, we, we don't know, yeah, which is advertising, at server.com, fingerprinting general, Demdex, it's uh, actually Adobe, uh, printing fingerprinting general. Yeah, we found that Adobe cookies to be very, very pervasive and very aggressive. Yeah, so you can see all these results are in the white papers, so everything is there. And again, that's a... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't very inspired when I prepared this. That yeah, I was so tired. So this is the tip of the iceberg, and it's very. <laughs> I tried to find something I mean less obvious, but I couldn't come up with anything because my brain was fried. So I'm sorry. This is somebody observing like uh, icebergs. Yeah. Uh, apparently, it's like an activity somewhere where there is icebergs. Um, so anyway, it's uh, it's about you know again. It's just like the micro tip of the iceberg, I can't stress this enough you know, because this is very important. There is like all this ecosystem, like it's a massive octopus. Um, with the physicists I work at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, they compare it to uh, dark energy, you know, like is this matter that's very basically is the most present in the universe and that's how the universe expands because of dark matter, but nobody knows how it's working. So the ad tech ecosystem, it's a little bit like that, you know, it just keeps on expanding through cookies, collecting, you know, user data and just, you know, making it bigger and nobody really understands what's going on there. And I think there is like another layer of, uh, we have to see cookies as something that, it's not just that they're sucking data, but they are parasitizing our computers and they're using energy from our computers to keep on expanding this ecosystem that ultimately is making third companies very, very rich and powerful. Yeah, but nobody is being <laughs> held accountable from the, as the users having to pay part of the electricity bill. Yeah, and uh, I'm able to control the CO2 emissions. So that's why mostly I did these projects to make these companies be held accountable for this, uh, or at least to start talking about this, because this is not a public debate. Yeah, I mean, pervasive revenge has been a public debate, especially since Snowden revelations, but not this, not the uh, and, uh, carbon cost of pervasive surveillance. This is something that doesn't exist. Yeah, um, I talked to several journalists, this is the project, so you have here a text by Matthew and by Marta Peirano, Marta made a wonderful, wonderful text as well. And that's the project, which is just recently baked. Uh, so I talked to many journalists uh, these days in order to launch the project and so on, and all of them were very surprised, like, oh, that's very, a very big angle. I said, okay, so you think it's going to have some sort of, you know, repercussion? I said, we don't know, because it's a very new angle, you know, we don't know which way it's going to go, so uh, we'll need to see. But anyway, so here just like a visualization of, it's impossible to uh, visualize all the cookies that are being activated in real time. Yeah, it's just not possible because we don't have the numbers. Um, but that's sort of a visualization of this, you know, this is supposed to be like a cookie dumpster. And uh, it has to have like this feeling of, yeah, there is a lot of cookies that activate, probably it's like, 30,000 times more than this, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's actually being nice. And then um, you can see like all the different companies. Uh, for this visualization, we use like the top 500 findings because the computer was crashing. Yeah, we couldn't put like a data set of 21 million um, uh, cookies in, in the server, it, it just crashed. Yeah, that's why we released also the white paper. I'm going to release the data according to this. But for visualization purposes, this was enough. Like the top 500, it's really enough. So I think also it will be very overwhelming. You can see like these Photoshop backgrounds are for the unknown. And we thought it was very important to keep it that way. 
So we understand that how much of unknown this ecosystem is. And here there is like this first layer and then you click on anything. So for that, this cookie name is DI2, category is social, host address at this, number of hosts used by this cookie, just one, number of websites that contain this cookie. You can click here, then you have like a list of all the websites that we found this cookie on. Yeah, number of cookies owned by this organization, you can also click here. And this is all the unique cookies owned by this organization with the number of times that we've identified them. Yeah, maybe you can see this. Yeah. This was very hard to do, so we still like, you know, maybe there is a little bit like some glitches, but uh, the data is basically there. Do you want me to click on some particular Google? Yeah, so Google, AMP token, Google, host address multiple, number of egg websites, and number of cookies owned by this organization. As I said, it's massive, yeah. Massive, massive list of cookies. Unique cookies. This is unique cookies, and it's not all the cookies. All the cookies, it's more than, than 2 million. But unique, it's, it's these ones. It's uh, 300 something. Yeah. So, well, that's a project that's been the last two years of my life and the last month that I just didn't sleep. But uh, I'm really happy it's done. Now I feel like it's done after <laughs> this talk. So, thank you very much.